Hello, boys and girls. My name is Mrs. Gooden, and I'm a media specialist at Whitney Young School. And today we're going to talk about what is the Dewey Decimal System? Who created it? Where did it come from? And why do we need it? So let's go. First, let's talk about nonfiction. Nonfiction, nonfiction are books that teach, inform, and explain real things. Remember that. Now, I have a little challenge for you. Which books are nonfiction? So I've paired some books. Let's take a look at the first two. Charlotte's Web versus Spider. Which one do you think is nonfiction? Hmm. Did you say spiders? You're correct. All right, next challenge. Black Panther versus Africa. Did you say Africa? Great job. All right, the last one. Escape from Mr. Limoncello's library versus working at the library. Which one do you think is nonfiction? Which one is real? You got it. Working at the library. Great job. So now let's get into talking about the Dewey Decimal System. Who created it? Where did it come from? Well, it was created by a man by the name of Melville Lewis Kufoff Dewey. He was born December 10th, 1851. I know, a really long time ago. <laughs> but interesting fact about him, he was very interested in simplifying spelling. At one point, he even shortened the spelling of his own name. So this guy was an American librarian who created the widely used classification system in the whole wide world to help organize libraries and make it just a little bit easier to find books in a library according to subject. All public school and, and, and school libraries in general use this system. All libraries in the U.S. Can you believe that? So if you're looking for a book, let's say on Fortnite, how to play it, you can go to any library in the United States and find that in the same area. So let's say you even go to Orchard School or Whitney Young or any one of our high schools, you're going to find that book in the same area of the library. Kind of cool system. So here is a simplified version of the system, the Dewey Decimal System. It's the zero the hundreds, the two hundreds, the three hundreds, the four hundreds, the five hundreds, the six hundreds, the seven hundreds, the eight hundreds, and the nine hundreds. And each one is separated into a different category. For example, the two hundreds, you would find books on religion. The seven hundreds, you're going to find books on sports. Now here it's broken down a little bit further. So if you take a look, let's look at the three hundreds here. In the 300s, they're called the social sciences. You're gonna find books on education, fairy tales, holidays, and even government books. However, if you went down to the 700s, you're gonna find those books on Fortnite, on TV uh, shows, on uh, drawing and crafts. It's a pretty cool and elaborate system, if you ask me. So let's practice using the Dewey Decimal System. Here I have a book on ancient Rome and I need to put it back on the shelf. As a librarian, I do a lot of that. So we've got to find where it needs to go. Let's see, if I start in the zeros, general works, what do you want to know? Mm, doesn't really sound like, yeah, it's something I want to know, but that doesn't sound like the right place. What about down to the 500, science and math? How can I explain the world around me? Eh, not quite. <gasps> Wait a minute. I think I see it. Do you see it? All the way at the bottom, 900. It says geography, history, and biography. What was the world like in the past? Well, the title is called Ancient Rome. Ancient makes me think of something from a long time ago. I've got a feeling this book belongs in the 900s. What do you think? Do you agree? Yes, you are correct. <gasps> Library lockdown! Oh my goodness, I can't.
can't find my car keys. The library is almost closing. I've got these four books. If we use the Dewey Decimal System, maybe I can find my car keys. Let's use our cheat sheet. Come on, let's go with me. Ohio should be around the 900s. Ohio. Wow, Ohio is a state. Let's see, this must be where I got the book. Mm. No keys. You gotta hurry up. Next book, The Junior Cookbook. Well, I know cookbooks are in the 600s. So let's see if my keys are there. Oh, we're in the 600s. Inventions? No, that's not cooking. Mm, transportation? No. Keep going. 629. Pets. Ah, food! That's got to be where the cookbook belongs. Mm. Still no car keys. Oh, my goodness. Let's see. Um, I think the next book I checked, picked up was the book on weather. Um, that's in the 500s. Let's see if we can find 500s. Oh, here we are right here. Math. Space. But this is 551, and I'm at 516. So should I go that way or that way? Well, the numbers seem to be getting bigger. So I'm going to keep going this way. Let's see. Ah, science. Weather is definitely science. Still. No keys. Okay, I gotta hurry up. The library is closing any minute now. My last book, Cinderellan. It's a Caribbean fairy tale. But it's about uh, like Cinderella. Let's see if I can find my keys over there. Three ninety-eight. Three ninety-eight. I'm using the Dewey Decimal System, so it must be down this way. Oh my gosh! decimal system to retrace my steps and find my car keys. Thanks for your help. Bye. Hello everyone. My name is Jason Levy and I'm the music teacher from Campus International School. Today we're going to be learning a song by Pete Seeger whose messages of universal understanding and social justice have inspired generations and have left a lasting legacy. And we are so lucky today because we're going to have my friend, Mr. Franklin, from Benjamin Franklin School help us out. Mr. Franklin? Thank you, Mr. Levy. Pete Seeger is in the Songwriters Hall of Fame because he was an amazing songwriter. And he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But he never played rock and roll. In fact, he was making music before it even existed. And then when rock and roll was invented, he just kept on playing folk music. Why is he in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Well, it's because so many other people in there said that their music wouldn't be the same if they hadn't grown up listening to him. So even though he never played rock and roll, rock and roll wouldn't be the same without Pete Seeger. Well, he was a really fascinating person. He went to Harvard University. He was a corporal in the Army Band. You should go read all about it. Then one day he writes a song, and it's called If I Had a Hammer, and this song was recorded by many people who were really famous during their time, such as Trini Lopez, Johnny Cash, Sam Cooke, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Leonard Nimoy. Leonard Nimoy recorded this song. As you listen today, what is meant by If I Had a Hammer? What do you think is meant by If I Had a Bell? Mr. Levy. Thanks, Mr. Franklin. So today we're going to be learning a song called If I Had a Hammer by Pete Seeger. Now this song has four verses, so just listen to the first verse this first time so you can get a better idea of what it sounds like. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the evening, a 
all over this land. I'd hammer out danger. I'd hammer out warning. I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters. All over this land. So now that you've heard it the first time, let's take it a little bit slower and I'll sing a line and you echo after me. One, here I go. If I had a hammer, if I had a hammer, my turn, I'd hammer in the morning. I'd hammer in the morning. My, my turn. I'd hammer in the evening. I'd hammer in the evening. All over this land. All over this land. Super job. So now let's try all four lines together at the same time. And if you forget the words, it's okay because they'll be at the bottom of the screen and that'll help you out. Let's try it together. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the evening, all over this land. Very good, you're picking this song up very quickly. So now the next part, I'll sing a line, you echo after me. I'd hammer out danger, I'd hammer out danger, I'd hammer out warning, I'd hammer out warning. I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters. I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters. All, all, over this land, over this land. So that last line together sounds like, all over this land, all, land. So try that last section with me. I'd hammer out danger. I'd hammer out warning. I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters. All over this land. So now let's go all the way back to the very beginning of the song and we'll try that first verse. Sing it with me. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the evening, all over this land. I'd hammer out danger, I'd hammer out warning, I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters, all over this land. Excellent job. So now Mr. Franklin's going to help you with verses two and verse three. Mr. Franklin? Wow, that was so good. Okay, let's just do this. I'm going to give you half of a verse and you sing it after me. Half of a verse. If I had a bell, I'd ring it in the morning. I'd ring it in the evening. All over this land. That much. Here we go. If I had a bell. Listen to the second half. I'd ring out danger. Keep listening. I'd ring out a warning. I'd ring out love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. Everybody. I'd ring out danger. I'd ring out a warning. I'd ring out love between my brothers and my sisters going to go to the third verse and I will do the whole third verse and then you will do the whole third verse with me. Me once alone, then once with everyone. If I had a song, just me, I'd sing it in the morning. I'd sing it in the evening. All over this world. Change. i sing out danger. I'd sing out a warning. together. If I had a song, one, a two, a three. If I had a song, I'd sing it in the morning. I'd sing it in the evening. All over this world, that would change. I'd 
sing out of danger, I'd sing out of warning, I'd sing out of love between the brothers and the sisters all over this land. I think there's one more verse to sing, and I think Mr. Lovey's going to teach that one. Thanks, Mr. Franklin. So this last verse takes all of the elements that we've already sung about. If I had a hammer, if I had a bell, if I had a song to sing, and it puts them all together into one final verse. So just listen the first time. Well, I got a hammer, and I got a bell, and I got a song to sing all over this land. It's the hammer of justice, it's the bell of freedom. It's the song about love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. All right, I think you can sing that much with me. So let's just do that, that first part of this fourth verse. Well, I got a hammer and I got a bell and I got a song to sing all over this land. Very good. So then it, it's the hammer of justice. It's the hammer of justice. Your, my turn. It's the bell of freedom. It's the bell of freedom. It's the song about love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. And you, that last part is very similar to the first time. It's the song about love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. So try that last whole section and we'll start back with it's the hammer of justice, it's the bell of freedom, it's the song about love between my brothers and my sisters. So let's try that and you can sing it with me. It's the hammer of justice, it's the bell of freedom, it's the song about love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. So we'll try that whole fourth verse together all the way with, well, I got a hammer. So try that with me. Well, I got a hammer and I got a bell and I've got a song to sing all over this land. It's the hammer of justice. It's the bell of freedom. It's the song about love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. Excellent job. So we're going to do the song one more time and we're going to do all four verses together. But this time we're going to do it with Mr. Franklin's help. So all of us are going to be singing together, Mr. Franklin, myself, and all of you. Mr. Franklin? All right, Mr. Levy. I think we're ready. Are you ready? You ready? If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. I'd hammer in the evening. All over this land.
smell of freedom, freedom. and song of love between brothers and sisters all, all over this land, 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 all over this land. That was amazing. You are such great singers. Now, at the very beginning of the lesson, Mr. Franklin asked you a couple of questions of things to think about with the lyrics. So, Mr. Franklin. We shall overcome someday. That's another song written by the same person, Mr. Pete Seeger. He's a man who used a banjo to try and heal the world. Did you think, as we asked earlier, about what it might mean to have a hammer? Whatever you decided, a hammer is a tool that builds. Did you think about what it might mean to have a bell? Whatever you decided, whatever interesting answers you came up with, a bell is something that gets people's attention. And they're both tools. Do you know that we all have a tool inside? And that tool is our voice. And our voice is what we can use for spreading a message. And what is your message? Is it a message of building? If so, the song tells us to share it with our brothers and our sisters. And who are our brothers and sisters? Is it our families, our neighborhoods, our schools, our city, our country, our world? That's for you to decide. But this is Pete Seeger's gift to the world was that song among many others. Mr. Lovey and I really thank you today for joining us. Right, Mr. Lovey? That's right, Mr. Franklin. And remember, all of you have a song inside your heart, and you can do your best to spread a little bit of love by singing a little bit every day. So again, I'm Jason Levy from Campus International School, and I can't wait to see you again next time. Thanks. Bye. So we're back to escape from Mr. Lemoncello's library, and we're going to be on chapter nine. Um, starting today and so far Kyle has figured out a way to get to the library's grand opening um, and so he's one of the last kids picked and now he's about to go home and tell his family about it so here we go Kyle couldn't wait to tell his family the good news I won the essay contest he showed them his shiny new library card congratulations said his mom Way to go, said his dad. His brothers, Curtis and Mike, were more interested in Kyle's other card, his $500 Lemoncello gift card. It's good for 12 months, said Kyle. But you need to use it now, said Mike. We need to go to the store tonight so you can buy me Mr. Lemoncello's Kooky Waggy Hockey. I can't. Why not? I have to show my library card at the store to cash it in. And... Um, I'm grounded, remember? You know, Kyle, said his dad, looking at his mother, who nodded. Since you worked extra hard and did such a bang-up job on your essay, I think you might consider suspending your punishment. Really? Really? Kyle's mom and dad smiled at him. The way they smiled whenever Mike won a football game or Curtis won the science fair. After supper, all five Keeleys piled into the family van and headed off to the local toy store. Lemoncello's hockey game is awesome, said Mike as they drove to the store, especially when the penguins play the polar bears. I'm hoping to find a classic board game, mused Curtis. Mr. Lemoncello's bewilderingly baffling bibliomania. Is that about the Bible? asked their dad from behind the wheel. Not exactly, said Curtis. Although the Bible, especially a rare Gutenberg edition, may be one of the treasures you must find and collect, because the object of the game is to collect rare and valuable books by... The penguins and Kooky Wacky Hockey aren't from Pittsburgh like in the NHL, said Mike, cutting off Curtis. They're from Antarctica, and the polar bears, they're from Alaska. Kyle had decided to divvy up his gift card five ways to give everybody, including his mom and dad, $100 to play with. As soon as they entered the toy store, the family split up, cruising the aisles with their own shopping carts. His mom was going to upgrade to Mr. Lemoncello's Restaurant Rush. His dad was looking for one of Mr. Lemoncello's complicated what-if historical games. What if the Romans had won the American Civil War? Kyle hung with Curtis and Mike for a while. Being the one with the gift card made him feel like he was suddenly their big brother. Mike quickly found his PlayStation hockey game, and Curtis was in geek heaven when he finally found Bibliomania. 
They only have one left, he gushed, tearing off the cellophane shrink wrap and prying open the lid. He sat down right in the middle of the store and unfolded the game board on his lap. You see, you start under the rotunda in the circular reading room, then you go upstairs and enter each of these ten chambers where you have to answer a question about a book? Um, I think I hear Mom calling me, said Kyle. She must need the gift card. Enjoy. And Kyle took off. The store will close in 15 minutes, announced a voice from the ceiling speakers. Kyle flew up and down the aisles and grabbed a couple of board games he didn't own yet, including Mr. Lemoncello's absolutely incredible Iron Horse, a game where you build your own transcontinental railroad, complete with locomotive game pieces that actually puff steam. As Kyle was doing some quick math to see if he'd spent his $100, Charles Chiltington rolled up the aisle with a cart crammed full with $500 worth of loot. If you remember, Charles Tiltington was the one who's kind of a teacher's pet. Um, they called him a brown noser. Games stacked on top of games were practically spilling over the sides. Mr. Lemoncello's phenomenal picture word puzzler, one of Kyle's favorites, was teaching, teetering on the top. Hello, Kiwi, said Chiltington with a smirk. He looked down at the three games sitting in the bottom of Kyle's shopping cart. Just getting started? No, I shared my gift card with my family. Really? Well, that was a mistake, wasn't it? Kyle was about to answer Chiltington when, when, about to answer when Chiltington said, So long, see you on Friday. Kyle wasn't 100% sure, but Charles might have also muttered, Loser. Since the bookstore was about to close, Kyle headed toward the checkout lanes. When he passed the customer service department, he saw Haley Daly. No, Kyle heard Haley say in a hushed tone to the clerk working the returns window, I do not want to return these items for store credit. I would prefer cash. Kyle finally found his family, showing, showed the cashier his library card, and paid for everything with a single swipe of his gift card. You know, Kyle, said his dad as the family walked across the parking lot, your mother and I are extremely proud of you. Writing a good essay isn't easy. Maybe you'll be an author someday, added his mom. Then you could write books that'll be on the shelves of the new library. Thanks, little brother, said Curtis, practically hugging his bibliomania box. Yeah, said Mike, this was awesome. Way to win one for the team. Best family game night ever, joked their dad. Kyle was enjoying his rare moment of glory, playing Santa Claus for his whole family. As the week dragged on, Friday night and the library lock-in started to remind Kyle of Christmas, too. It felt like they would never come. Then, finally, they did. Chapter 10 Now this is what I call a party, said Kyle's mother as she helped herself to a bacon-wrapped shrimp from a tray being carried, carried by a waiter in a tuxedo. Kyle and his parents were in the crowded ballroom of the Parker House Hotel for the Lemoncello Library's gala grand opening reception. The Parker House was located right across the street from the old Gold Leaf Bank building, and the cluster of office buildings, craft shops, clothing stores, and restaurants called Old Town. I'm gonna go see if I can find a Kimi, Kyle said to his mom and dad. Remember, that's his friend, his BFF. Give her our congratulations, said his mom. We're proud of her, too, added his dad. Kyle made his way through the glittering sea of dressed-up adults. They're at the party for the grand opening, right before the lock-in. Even though his parents had put on fancy clothes for the reception, Kyle was wearing something comfortable to go exploring in, as instructed by the lock-in guide he'd received on Wednesday. He'd packed a sleeping bag and a small suitcase with a change of clothes, toiletries, and yes, as requested, an extra pair of underpants. Kyle saw Sierra Russell all alone in a corner near a clump of curtains. It didn't look like her mother had come to the party with her. Sierra, of course, had her nose buried in a book. Kyle shook his head. The girl was about to spend the night in a building filled with books, and she was skipping all the free food and pop so she could read? That was just nutty. Haley Daly, wearing a sparkly blouse, was posing for a wall of photographers who wanted to snap her picture. Her mother was at the party, too. While the cameras were focused on Haley's smile, Mrs. Daly wrapped up a couple of chicken kebabs in a napkin and slipped them inside her purse. Now Kyle saw Charles Chiltington. Poor guy must not have read the memo about comfortable clothes. He was still wearing his khakis and blazer, just like his dad. Kyle figured the Chiltington family must own like 300 pairs of pleated tan pants. Those are like fancy pants with a fold in the middle of them. Hey, Kyle, Akimi said, wa waving at him from near a thick shrub, curled to look like a silly straw. Hey, said Kyle, did you remember to bring your library card? Yep, Kyle pulled it out of his pocket. Huh, said Akimi, I got two different books on the back of mine, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish by Dr. Seuss, and Nine Stories by J.D. Salinger. 
guess they're like baseball cards, said Kyle. They're all different. Hey, you guys, Miguel Fernandez, more excited than usual, which was saying something, pushed through the mob to join them. Did you try these puffy cheese things? Nah, said Kyle. I'm sticking to food I recognize. The puffy cheese things are called fromage tartlets, said Andrew Peckelman, coming over to join the group. Huh, said Kyle. Good to know. A waiter passed by with a tray loaded down with small boxes of Mr. Lemoncello's anagram cracker cookies. Oh, I love these, said Kyle, taking a box off the platter and opening it. The cookies are in the shapes of letters. You have to see how many words you can spell. Cool, said Miguel, snagging a fistful of cookies out of Kyle's box. Tastes good, too. Yep, said Kyle, but the more you eat, the harder the game gets. Why, asked Andrew Peckelman. Less letters, said Akimi, snatching two B's in a Q and wolfing them down. Mmm, barbecue flavored. Kyle spread out the remaining cookies in his palm. U-N-F-E-H-A-V. He grinned as he deciphered an easy anagram. Have fun. Sweet. So an anagram is kind of like a word puzzle where you get a whole bunch of different letters and you rearrange them to spell something new. Um, sometimes you try to use every letter, but sometimes you can just um, use some of the letters. There's a lot of games that use anagrams, and they're pretty fun to play. You can play them in the car and look at license plate and see if you can make up any words with different people's license plates. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Dr. Zinchenko, dressed in a bright red suit, strode to the center of the ballroom. May I have your attention, please? Mr. Lemoncello will be arriving shortly to say a few brief words. After that, I will escort the 12 essay contest winners across the street to the library. Therefore, children, might I suggest that you eat up? Food and drink are not permitted anywhere in the library except in the Book Nook Cafe, conveniently located on the first floor. Miguel grabbed a few more puffy, cheesy things. When she thought no one was looking, Mrs. Daly shoved a napkined bundle of bacon-wrapped shrimp into her purse. Gross. Mrs. Daly seems kind of weird. Akimi nibbled a couple of chocolate-dipped pretzel sticks. Are you going to grab some more grub, she said to Kyle? No, thanks. I don't like food I can play with. One last thing, announced Dr. Zinchenko. We, of course, want our winners to have fun tonight. However, I must insist that each of you respect my number one rule. Be gentle with each other and, most especially, the library's books and exhibits. Can you do that for me? Yes, shouted all the winners, except Charles Chiltington. He said, indubitably. Good thing the library has dictionaries, muttered Akimi. Half the time, it's the only way to figure out what Chiltington's saying. Suddenly, all the adults in the ballroom started clapping. Mr. Lemoncello, looking like a beanpole wearing a tailcoat and a tiny birthday party fireman's hat, strode into the room through a side door. Thank you, thank you, he said, stretching the elastic band to raise his kid-sized hat and tipping it toward the crowd. You are too kind. When he let go of the hat, it snapped back with a sharp thwack. As Dr. Zinchenko informed you, I'd like to say a few brief words. Here they are. Short, memorandum, and underpants. And let us pause to remember the immortal words of Dr. Seuss. The more that you... The more that you read, the more things you will know. The more that you learn, the more places you'll go. Children? Mr. Lemoncello flourished his arm toward the ballroom doors. It's time to go across the street. Your amazingly spectacular new public library awaits. That's the end of chapter 10. Finally, we're at chapter 11, and finally they're gonna go in this mysterious library. Ugh, I really want to know what the- tr there's got to be some sort of trick inside, that's what I think. Let's see. Chapter 11. Eager to see what was inside the new library, the 12 essay contest winners quickly gathered behind Dr. Zinchenko. This way, children, said the head librarian, follow me. The crowd cheered as they marched out of the ballroom, all toting their sleeping bags and suitcases. There was more cheering, plus some hooting and hollering when they reached the hotel lobby and went out the revolving doors into the street. The new public library, with its glistening gold dome, took up half a downtown block, its back butting up against an old-fashioned office tower. The building was a boxy fortress, three stories tall, with stately columns that acted like bookends because the windowless walls had been painted to resemble a, giant, a row of giant books lined up on a shelf. It's like a majestic Greek temple, gushed Miguel. 
and the world's biggest bookcase, added Sierra Russell, who had finally put away her paperback. Velvet ropes lined a path across Main Street that led to a red carpet leading up a flight of steps to the arched entryway and seriously steel, not to mention round, front door. Kyle had a smile when he saw what was tethered to the railings on either side of the steps. Balloons. Do you remember in his essay, his first bad essay, all he wrote about was a single sentence about how he wanted to see some balloons at the party, and then he had to change his essay, so he's still smiling about it. A big bruiser, maybe 6'4", 250 pounds, in sunglasses and a black sports coat, stood in front of the library's circular door, which had several large valve wheels, like you'd see on a submarine hatch. The burly guard wore his hair in long, ropey dreadlocks. What's with that door? asked Haley Daly, who, of course, had pushed her way to the front. She seems kind of bossy. It looks like it came from a bank vault or something. It is the door from the Gold Leaf Bank's walk-in vault, said Dr. Zinchenko. It weighs 20 tons. Kimi turned around and whispered, My dad designed the support structure for that thing. Check out the hinges. Kyle nodded. He was impressed. Why a vault door? asked Kayla Corson. Because, said Dr. Zinchenko, one sleepy Saturday, when Mr. Lemoncello was your age, he was working in the old public library over on Market Street. He was so lost in his thoughts, he did not hear the sirens as police cars raced past the library to the bank, where a burglar alarm had just been activated. This door serves as a reminder to us all. Our thoughts are safe when they are inside a library. Not even a bank robbery can disturb them. Miguel was nodding like crazy. He could relate. It also helps us keep our most valuable treasures secure. There aren't many windows, observed Andrew Peckelman, probably to, to stop bank robbers from busting in. But shouldn't you have added windows when you turned it into a library? A library doesn't need windows, Andrew. We have books, which are windows into worlds we'd never even dreamed possible. An open book is an open mind, added Charles Chiltington. That's what I always say. Dr. Zinchenko pulled out a bright red note card. Before we enter, please listen very carefully. Your library cards are the keys to everything you will need, she read. The library staff is here to help you find whatever it is you are looking for. She smiled slightly, tucked the card back into her pocket, turned to the security guard and said, Clarence, will you do the honors? With pleasure, Dr. Z. Clarence turned one giant wheel, spun another, and cranked a third. Noiselessly, the 20-ton door swung open. The first thing Kyle could see inside was a trickling fountain in a grand foyer of brilliant white marble. The fountain featured a life-size statue of, Dr. of Mr. Lemoncello standing on a lily pad in the middle of a shadow-reflecting pool ten feet wide. His head was tilted back so water could spurt up from his mouth in an arc. Kyle noticed a quote chiseled into the statue's pedestal. Knowledge not shared remains unknown. Luigi L. Lemoncello. Beyond the fountain, through an arched walkway, was a huge room filled with desks. When everybody had shuffled into the entrance hall, Dr. Zinchenko turned to the security guard. Clarence? Clarence hauled the heavy steel door shut. Kyle heard the whir of spinning wheels, the clink of grinding gears, and a reverberating clunk. Wow, said Miguel. Talk about a lock-in. I'll be in the control center, Dr. Z, said the security guard. Very well, Clarence. Clarence disappeared behind a red door. Now then, children, said the librarian, if you will all follow me into the rotunda reading room. As the rest of the group started filling into, filing into the gigantic circular room, Kyle checked out a display case beside the red door. A sign over it read, Staff Picks, Our Most Memorable Reads. A dozen books were lined up on four shelves. One cover in the middle of the bottom row caught Kyle's eye. It showed a football player wearing a number 19 jersey dropping back to hurl a pass. Kyle made a mental note of the title. In the pocket, Johnny, Unitas, and me. Tomorrow morning, when the lock-in was over, he might use his library card to check it out for his big brother, Mike. Wow. Everybody gasped as they stepped into the rotunda reading room and looked up. The entire underside of the dome looked like space as seen from the Hubble telescope. A dusty spiral nebula billowed up, a galaxy of stars twinkled, and meteorites whizzed across the ceiling. Ooh. The space imagery on the ceiling dissolved into ten distinct panels, each one becoming a display of swirling graphics. 
Those are the ten categories of the Dewey Decimal System, whispered Miguel, sounding awestruck. See the panel with Cleopatra, the guy mountain climbing, and the Viking ship sailing across it? That's for 900 to 999. History and geography. Cool, said Kyle. If you want to know more about the Dewey Decimal System, um, make sure you watch today's whole episode today or on YouTube because um, one of our teachers is actually doing a video all about that. It'll be very important for figuring out the rest of this book. Tucked beneath the ten screens in arched niches were incredible 3D statues glowing a ghostly green. I believe those are holographic projections, said Andrew Peckelman, waving up at a statue that was waving down at him. The room under the dome was huge. It was circular with a round desk at the center that was surrounded by four rings of reading desks. Kyle said that half of the rotunda was filled with floor-to-ceiling bookshelves. The other half had balconies on the second and third floors that reminded him of the open atrium of a hotel he and his family had stayed at once. While everybody was gawking at the architecture, that means kind of like looking at it and being amazed, Dr. Zinchenko woo, said the words Kyle had been waiting to hear all day. Now then, who's ready for our first game? Uh, Kyle really does love games, that's for sure. All right. Chapter 12. We're getting into the games now. Should be interesting. Will everybody please line up behind that far desk in front of the children's room, said Dr. Zinchenko, gesturing towards one of the wooden tables in the outermost ring of the room. How many of you are familiar with Mr. Lemoncello's classic board game, Hurry to the Top of the Heap? Twelve hands shot up. Very good, said Dr. Zinchenko. Ooh, there we go. Overhead, the Wonder Dome, Wonder Dome dissolved into a gigantic, curved heap box top. This will be a live, three-dimensional version of that game. Each of you will be asked a trivia question. If you are able to answer it correctly, you will roll the dice and advance the equivalent number of desks. When you return to the starting point, you will move into the next concentric circle of desks. When you complete that rank, you will move into the next, and so on. If one of you makes it all the way to my desk at the center, you will be declared the winner. So this book has a lot of um, things that you really have to visualize. And stuff like this, especially the setting, and since it's going to be an important part of this book and a game, um, you might want to try drawing out. So let us pull up the whiteboard. We'll pull up the whiteboard and let's draw what this would look like. Here we go. So it's going to be a live dimensional game. So there's all these desks and it says concentric rings and concentric just means circles within circles within circles. So it's not a spiral like it, the line doesn't just keep connecting and going. It's individual circles inside of each other. Let's erase this one. Get out of there. All right, so this the game they're playing, they start out here on the edge of the circle. And every time they answer a question right, they're going and roll the dice. They get to go a certain amount of desks around. And once they get back to the starting point back here where they started, they don't keep going. They move inside one circle. So now they're closer. And Dr. Zinchenko is right here. I'm trying to write Dr. Z, it's very small. So Dr. Zinchenko's in the middle, and what they're trying to do is answer enough to get into the inner circle. All right, let's erase that. Oh, drawing stuff out is always very helpful when you're trying to visualize something in a book, particularly when, particularly when it's something weird and complicated like this one is. <clears throat> Where were we? All right, here we go. But we don't have any dice, said Yasmin Smith-Snyder. Yes, you do. See that smoky panel in the center of the desk? It's actually a touchscreen computer, currently running Mr. Lemoncello's dice rolling app. Simply swipe and flick your fingers across the glass to toss and tumble the animated dice. Dr. Sinchenko placed a stack of red cards on her desk. She looked like the host of a TV game show. Before we begin, are there any other questions? 
Charles Chiltington raised his hand. Yes, Mr. Chiltington? What will the winner win? After all, the prize is the most important part of any game. Kyle didn't totally agree, but he was excited about playing the game. To, he, was so, he was too excited about playing the game to say anything. Tonight's first prize, said Dr. Zinchenko, is this golden key granting the winner access to Mr. Lemoncello's private and very posh, posh is like fancy, bedroom suite up on the library's third floor. Instead of spending the night on the floor in a sleeping bag, you'll be relaxing in luxury with a feather bed, a 72-inch television screen, and a state-of-the-art gaming console. Okay, Kyle was definitely interested in this particular prize. Judging from the wide-open eyes and chorus of oohs and wows all around him, so was everybody else. Dr. Zinchenko flipped over the first question card. What major league pitcher was the last to win at least 30 games in one season? Six players got it wrong before Kyle got it right. Denny McLean, correct. He swiped the glass panel, rolled a 10, and advanced 10 desks around the room. He's starting off pretty good. What United States Navy ship was once captured by the North Koreans? Miguel nailed that one, the USS Pueblo. He flew 12 spaces around the room. What did Apollo 8 accomplish that had never been done before? Akimi, Andrew Peckelman, and Kayla Corson struck out on that one, but Charles Chiltington knew the answer. It was the first spacecraft to orbit the moon. Correct. Chiltington rolled a five, landing him in last place. Kyle's next question was tougher. Who was famous for saying, book em, Dano? Um, that guy on Hawaii Five-0? That's an old television show. Please be more specific. Uh, the one with the shiny hair, Jack Lord? That is correct. Kyle breathed a sigh of relief. Thank goodness he and his dad sometimes watched reruns of old TV shows from the 1960s. But when he flicked the computerized dice, his luck hit a brick wall. He rolled snake eyes and moved up two measly desks. Meanwhile, Miguel went down with a question about Barbara Streisand. Kyle wasn't exactly sure who she was. And Charles Chiltington surged ahead with a correct answer about the Beatles' Hey Jude and a double sixes roll. As the game went on, Kyle and Chiltington, the only players still standing, kept answering correctly and moving around the room until they were both seated at a desk in the innermost ring, only six spaces away from Dr. Zinchenko's desk and victory. Kyle was seriously glad he and his mom had played so many games of Trivial Pursuit, with the original extremely old cards. Trivial Pursuit is a trivia game that's a lot like what they're playing here in the library. Basically, you get a card and you answer it and you can move spaces if you answer it correctly. And they're just random, random questions about random stuff around the world. Kyle, here's your next question. What song in the movie Dr. Doolittle won an Academy Award? Kyle squinted. He had that movie. An old VHS cassette tape that his mom had bought at a garage sale. Too bad they didn't have a VCR to watch it on. But even though he'd never seen the movie, he had read the front and back of the box a couple of times. Um, talk to the animals? Correct. He started breathing again. Roll the dice, please, Mr. Keeley. Kyle did. Another pair of ones. He moved up two spaces. Now he was only four desks away from winning. Mr. Chiltington, here is your qu next question. Who was elected president in 1968? I believe that was Richard Milhouse Nixon. You are also correct. Chiltington didn't wait for the librarian to tell him to roll the dice. He flicked his finger across the glass pad. Yes, double sixes again. He moved around the last ring of desks, tapping their tops, counting them off, even though everybody knew his 12 was more than good enough to carry him to the finish line. Congratulations, Mr. Chiltington, Dr. Zinchenko said. As she handed in the key to the private suite, you are this evening's winner. Thank you, Dr. Zinchenko. I am truly and sincerely honored. Congratulations, Charles, said Kyle. Way to win. Get used to it, Keeley, he answered in a voice only the other kids could hear. I'm a Chiltington. We never lose. Chiltington is sounding more and more kind of mean and nasty in this book. All right, we're all done with chapter 12. All right, last chapter for today, chapter 13. So Kyle has lost this first game, but he was really close to the end. It was just him and Charles Chiltington. So let's see what goes next. What happened next was extremely cool. 
A holographic image of a second librarian appeared beside Dr. Zinchenko at the center desk. She looked a little like Princess Leia be being beamed out of R2-D2 in Star Wars. Except she had an old-fashioned bubble top hairdo, cat's eye glasses, and a tweed jacket with patches on the elbows. Here to present our official library lock and rules, said Dr. Zinchenko, is Mrs. Gail Tobin, head librarian of the Alexandriaville Public Library back in the 1960s, when Mr. Lemoncello was your age. Overhead, the Wonder Dome had shifted back to its ten Dewey Decimal displays. How old is she? said asked Keith Sean Keegan. She'd be 110 if she were still alive. But she's dead and working here? Well, let's just say her spirit lives on in this hologram. Mrs. Tobin's the one who helped Mr. Mr. Lemoncello so much, Kyle whispered to Akimi, when he was a kid. I know, her hair looks like a beehive. Kyle shrugged. From what I've seen on TV, the 1960s were generally weird. Welcome, children, to the library of the future, said the flickering projection. Dr. Zinchenko will now pass out Lemoncello Library floor plans, your map and guide to all that this extraordinary building has to offer. Your new library cards will grant you access to all rooms except the Master Control Center, the red door that you passed on your way in, and, of course, Mr. Lemoncello's private suite on the third floor. Charles Chiltington dangled his golden key in front of his face. I believe you need this to enter that. Miss Tobin, Mrs. Tobin ignored him. She was a hologram. That made it easier. Security personnel are on duty 24 hours a day, she continued. During your stay, all of your actions will be recorded by video cameras as outlined in the consent agreements you and your parents signed earlier. Are we going to be on a reality TV show, asked Haley, smiling up at a tiny camera with a blinking red light. It is a distinct possibility, said Dr. Zinchenko. I like television, said the ghostly image of Mrs. Tobin. Rowan and Martin's Laughing is my favorite program. Returning to the rules. The use of personal electronic devices is strictly prohibited at all times during the lock-in. The security guard, Clarence, and a, guy who look, ooh, and a guy who looked like his identical twin brother, entered the rotunda, each of them carrying an aluminum attache case. Kindly deposit all cell phones, iPods, and iPads in the receptacles provided by our security guards, Clarence and Clement. Your devices will be safely stored for the duration of your stay and will be returned to you at the conclusion of our activities. Also, you may use the desktop desktop pad computers in this room to comb through our card catalog and conduct internet research. However, these devices cannot send or receive email or text messages, whatever those might be. Remember, I retired in 1973. We still used carbon paper. And now, Dr. Zinchenko will walk you through the floor plan. Everybody unfolded their map pamphlets. As you can see, said Dr. Zinchenko, fiction titles are located here in the reading room. The children's enrichment room with soundproof walls is over there. Two fully equipped community meeting rooms, as well as the Book Nook Cafe behind those windows where the curtains are drawn, are also located on this floor. Upstairs, or two, you will find ten numbered doors, each leading into a chamber filled with books, information, and, well, displays related to its corresponding Dewey Decimal category. Kyle raised his hand. Yes? Where's the Electronic Learning Center? Dr. Zinchenko grinned, upstairs on the third floor, where you will also find the boardroom, the art and artifacts room, the IMAX theater, the Lemoncello Abilia room, Lemoncello Abilia room, the... Can we go upstairs and play? asked Bridget Wodge. I want to try out the space shuttle simulator. I want to learn how to drive a car, said Sean Keegan. A race car. I want to conquer the world with Alexander the Great, said Yasmin smith Snyder. Apparently, everybody was doing what Kyle had already done, checking out the available educational game where it listed on the back of the floor plan. Early access to Electronic Learning Center will be tonight's second prize, said Dr. Zinchenko. To win it, you must use the library's resources to find dessert, dessert, which we have hidden somewhere in the building. Oh, that's cool. Whoever does the research and locates the goodies first will also be the first one allowed into the Electronic Learning Center. So use your wits and use your library. Go find dessert. Everybody raced around the room and sat down at separate desks to start tapping on the glass computer pads. Well, everybody except Sierra Russell. She spent like two seconds swiping her fingers across a screen, wrote down something down with a stubby pencil on a slip of paper, then wandered off to inspect the three-story tall, curved bookcases lining the walls at the back of the half of the rotunda. 
Kaya watched as she stepped onto a slightly elevated platform with handles like you'd see on your grandmother's walker. It even had a basket attached to the front. Dr. Zinchenko? Yes, Miss Russell? Is this safe? Because the book I want is all the way up at the top. Yes, just make sure your feet are securely locked in. Sierra wiggled her leg. Kyle heard a metallic snap. It's like a ski boot, said Sierra. That's right, now use the keypad to tell the hover ladder the call number for the book you're interested in. And hang on tight. Sierra consulted the slip of paper and tapped some keys. The bottom of that platform you're standing on is a magnet, said Dr. Zinchenko. There are ribbons of electromagnetic material in the lining of the bookcases. The strengths of those magnets will be modulated by our maglev computer based on the call number you input. Two seconds later, Sierra Russell was floating in the air, drifting up and to the left. It was absolutely awesome. The hover ladder must use advanced magnetic levitation technology, said Miguel, seated at the desk to Kyle's right, just like the maglev bullet trains in Japan. Cool, mumbled Kyle. And for the first time in his life, Kyle Keeley wanted to check out a library book more than anything in the world. That's really cool. So the maglev thing that they're talking about, um, it's basically a normal train, like a normal really fast train, but instead of it having wheels on the bottom, it actually sits on top of nothing. There's a magnet um, below it, and it has a magnet in it, and if you've ever played with magnets, you know that if you have two and you stick the opposite sides towards each other, they start pushing away from each other. That's kind of how the maglev train works. So this, there's air in between it. It actually looks like it's floating. And what this does is it allows the train to go really, really fast because there's a lot less friction um, than when the maglev train or when any kind of train would be on the ground or using wheels because all it's um, sitting on is air. It doesn't have to interact with the ground, which is pretty cool. You can Google that, and there's some really cool videos of that as well. 